The term working memory is based on a simple idea that complex thought processes depend on a single system that operates across a wide range of situations. For example, mental arithmetic, multiplying 22 by 7, for example, giving directions to your house, to a friend, or working out what the best way of choosing a new vacuum cleaner might be. All of these are assumed to depend on this common system. It's a concept that's currently used very widely with thousands of references per year. Of course, not everyone agrees about it, but I want to suggest that most of the approaches are broadly consistent, but differ because of the different interests and backgrounds of the different research workers and theorists. Given that that's the case, I should perhaps start by saying what my background is, where I'm coming from. Before working on working memory, I did research on memory. So I tend to emphasize the memory aspect rather than the attention. I spent many years of my life working at the Applied Psychology Unit in Cambridge, which was tasked with combining basic and applied research. And consequently, I'm interested in ideas that can be used widely, and that means trying to keep things simple. Thirdly, I've been fortunate enough over the years to work with a number of very talented neuropsychologists and to have access to some very informative patients with very pure deficits. And all of these have influenced my approach. Others uh, have come from different approaches, from attention, more interested perhaps in uh, computer modeling and so forth. So where did it all start? In my case, when I began in, as a psychologist in the 1950s, memory was memory, a single unitary faculty. Then in the 1960s, that began to change with the development of an information processing approach to psychology based on the computer metaphor. And that resulted in the proposal that there was more than one kind of memory. This is a, a simplified view of the multi-store model of memory that was dominant in the 60s. It assumed that information came in from the environment into a temporary sensory memory system that was essentially part of perception. From there was passed on to a short-term memory which then passed on information to long-term memory. The assumption was that essentially in order to achieve long-term learning, information had to go through the short-term store. There were a wide range of models that broadly followed this pattern, but the most influential, sometimes called the modal model, was that presented by Atkinson and Schifrin in the late 1960s. That assumed that the short-term store also acted as a working memory, a system for holding information while you process it and using that processing for achieving a range of complex tasks. The model was widely accepted and appeared in textbooks for many years, but began to have problems. The first was concerned with their assumption about getting information from the short term to the long term store. Their assumption was that merely holding information in the short term store would guarantee transfer to long term memory. That proved not to be the case much more important than how long you hold the information is what you do with it, with deeper, more elaborate encoding leading to better long-term learning. The levels of processing effect um, 
developed by Craig and Lockhart. A second problem came from the neuropsychological evidence, which seemed to indicate two separate stores. Evidence for a long-term store came from amnesic patients, such as the classic patient HM, studied by Brenda Milner. He had a devastating disruption of long-term memory, having great difficulty in acquiring new information, while having normal intelligence, normal language, and normal short-term memory, as measured, for example, by digit span, repeating back a telephone number. A second class of patient, studied by Chalice and Warrington, showed exactly the opposite pattern. They had impaired short-term memory. For example, if you gave them a telephone number, once it got beyond two digits, they would forget it, coupled with normal long-term memory. Notice that although this argues for two separable systems, it presents a problem for the modal model, since the impaired short-term memory should impair input into long-term memory, so they should be amnesic. Furthermore, if the short-term store was a working memory, they should have major problems in complex thought. Neither of these were the case. One such um, patient worked as an efficient secretary, another one as a taxi driver, a third ran a shop and a family. So there were problems with the modal model and people started to move away looking at levels of processing and semantic memory. This was the point at which I obtained my first grant to work with Graham Hitch on the relationship between short-term and long-term memory. It seemed an inopportune time since everyone was leaving the field, but we decided that we would try and tackle the question, what function did short-term memory serve? What was it for? We didn't have access to short-term memory patients, so what we did was to take our student subjects and turn them into patients. We did this not by removing chunks of their brain, but by using what's become known as the dual task method. That goes as follows. If you assume that you have a limited short-term store and you gradually fill it up, then the more it's filled, the less should be left for performing other tasks. So we gave our subjects a series of tasks that we assumed would depend on working memory and had them perform these at the same time as they were remembering one, two, anything up to six digits, a six-figure telephone number. This shows the results of one of our experiments in which our students attempted to solve very simple reasoning questions while holding anything from zero to eight digits. As you can see, on the vertical y-axis, there is how long it took to solve each problem. Along the bottom axis is the number of digits they were holding, and as you can see, it took longer the heavier the digit load. However, notice that the cost was not enormous. It was from 2.2 to a little over 2.8 seconds, less than 50%. Even more striking is the error rate, which is reflected by the flat line, which remained at about 5%. Clearly, the system we were filling up was involved in working memory, but it was by no means the whole story. We decided we needed to complicate the model. This shows the slightly more complicated model we proposed. It involves three components, an attentional system, the egg-shaped part in the middle, which we assume is limited in capacity and runs the show, aided by 
two subsystems. The one on the right, the phonological loop, is one that we assume holds verbal and sound information. We assume that it is this that is principally responsible for holding our digit sequences. On the left is an equivalent system which we assume is necessary for holding visual and spatial information. And we assume that together that these work together in a coherent way. One way of getting a feel for this is to try the following. I want you to try and work out how many windows there are in your current house or apartment. Most people try to do that by forming a visual image and going around counting one, two, three, four. The central executive is the system for generating the strategy and running it. The visuospatial sketch pad holds the image and the counting is done by the phonological loop. We decided that we needed to explore our model in more detail and we opted to start with the phonological loop simply because we thought this was the simplest and it was the system we knew quite a lot about from earlier experiments on verbal short-term memory. We proposed a very simple model, one that assumes a temporary storage of some sort of acoustic or phonological code and an active rehearsal process that involves saying things to yourself. So if I were to give you my telephone number, you would store it and keep refreshing it by saying it to yourself. I want you to listen to a sequence of five short words and then say them back to yourself. You'll know if you remembered them. Here's the first set. Pit, day, cow, pen, top. Pit, day, cow, pen, top. No problem. Even I can remember them. How about this set? Mat, map, can, man, cap. Not so easy. Mat, map, can, man, cap. So what's the difference? Well, they're similar. Uh, trying to hold the order, you get confused. So it's any kind of similarity equivalent. Try this. Huge, big, wide, large, tall. Huge, big, wide, large, tall. Simple. So it's not any kind of similarity, it's similarity of sound. If we change the experiment, and instead of giving you five, I'd given you ten words, and I gave you several trials to learn it, the effect would switch, and meaning would become all important, suggesting that the phonological loop is interested in sound, but not in meaning. Of course, other parts of the system do use meaning um, and doesn't mean the fact that you're relying on sound does not mean that you don't understand the meaning. What about the rehearsal process? Well, one more simple experiment. Once again, I want you to re remember just five words and repeat them back to yourself. Refrigerator, opportunity, tuberculosis, university, hippopotamus. You got that? Not so easy again. It was refrigerator, opportunity, tuberculosis, university, hippopotamus. So what was happening there? Well, if you were trying to say them to yourself, you couldn't say them fast enough such that by the time you've said the fifth one, you hadn't forgotten the first one. This shows the results of an experiment in which we again presented lists of five words, but they varied in length from one to five syllables. The other function shows how long it takes to read a sequence of syllables. Not surprisingly, long words take longer to recite, and you can summarize this by saying that 
people can remember as much as they can say in about two seconds. We ourselves initially interpreted this, and still do, in terms of a memory trace that fades away unless it can be refreshed through rehearsal and a rehearsal rate that depends on the length of the material. Evidence for this comes if you stop people rehearsing, if you have them say something irrelevant like blah, 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 what happens is that performance drops and you lose the word length effect. Whether this reflects a fading memory trace or not has remained controversial since we published this back in 1975. The question of whether traces decay or are interfered with in short-term memory is a tough one to crack. And while people claim to have cracked it, um, not everyone would agree. Fortunately, so far as the broad model is concerned, it doesn't matter whether forgetting occurs by trace decay or interference, although, of course, it's an interesting question. So, as you can see, I've simply talked about one simple component of our original model. I don't have time to talk in any detail about the visuospatial sketchpad or the central executive, but I'd like to illustrate the operation of the visuospatial sketchpad by an experience that I had when on sabbatical in Southern California. I became interested in American football and was listening to a big game between UCLA and Stanford on my car radio as I drove along the freeway. I had a nice clear image of the game and how it was progressing when suddenly I noticed that the car was weaving from lane to lane and switched to music and survived. When I got back to Britain, I explored this and was able to demonstrate that holding a visual image was inconsistent with a motor task. We weren't able to uh, afford a driving simulator, but a simple task of keeping a stylus in t contact with a spot of light was enough to disrupt visual imagery. More recently, this area of visual short-term and working memory has become very active, um, but I don't have time to go into that here. In the case of the central executive, much of my thinking was influenced by the work of Tim Chalice on patients with frontal lobe damage. Patients who have damage to both left and right frontal lobes tend to have major attentional problems. Some of these cause difficulty in focusing attention and a liability to be distracted. For example, one patient, while being tested by a doctor, uh, caught sight of a hypodermic needle, reached over and attempted to inject the doctor. Similarly, on occasion, attention would be captured by a single stimulus or a single situation. Frontal lobe patients also often have difficulty in switching attention, so they become focused on a task and can't break away. So one patient I studied in occupational therapy was attempting to measure lengths of tape uh, and cut them off. He consistently cut in the wrong place and when the occupational therapist pointed this out, he said crossly, I know, I know, but continued doing it. And this lack of attentional control is a deficit in a system that is absolutely essential for controlling working memory and also behavior more generally. So we had a simple three component model. Where next? Well, when talking about the phonological loop and my simple little model, someone raised the question of what function did it serve? Why do we have this other than to keep cognitive psychologists happy? And I began to wonder what could be the evolutionary purpose. 
at that point, I was fortunate enough to um, have the opportunity to work with a patient with a very pure phonological loop deficit with two Italian colleagues, Beppe Ballar and Costanza Papagno. And we were able to ask, what is it that she can't do? She had normal intelligence, apparently normal language. So what couldn't she do, apart from not repeat back telephone numbers? We eventually hit on the idea that perhaps it was a system for acquiring language in the first place. And so we attempted to teach her Russian vocabulary. What we found was that although she could learn pairs of words in her na native Italian perfectly well, she was extremely bad at learning new vocabulary. We went on to look at this in children who had specific language problems. Could their language problem be dependent on an impairment in the phonological loop? We found that this was the case. It seemed to be a much better predictor of their problem in acquiring vocabulary than, for example, hearing problems or articulation problems. And finally, we, and we in this case is Susan Gavacole and myself, looked at a range of normal children and found that normal four-year-olds, you could predict their vocabulary much better by their ability to hear and repeat back an unfamiliar non-word than by general intelligence. So it suggests that this system perhaps has evolved for the acquisition of language. It also seems to be associated with the early stages of learning to read, so that dyslexic people tend to have poor digit span and poor performance on our non-word repetition test. So we now need to link our model with long-term memory. And the next version of the model is shown here. The shaded area refers to long-term memory or crystallized systems, systems that are based on long-term learning, whereas the other parts of working memory are so-called fluid systems. They depend on what's operating at the moment. The arrows indicate that the phonological loop feeds information into language and also that language influences the phonological loop. So if you're repeating back an unfamiliar non-word, if it's similar to your native language, you'll do better at it. This also means that in terms of acquiring new words, both your phonological loop and what you already know, your existing vocabulary, are both important. We speculate that something similar will happen in the visual spatial sketch pad, but we've not actually explored this. At this point, we assume that the central executive was a purely attentional system, that it couldn't hold information. We did that because we felt that it would be too difficult to test if we assumed that our executive could both store and attend. But that left us with a problem. How did the different parts of the system talk to each other? Because neither the sketch pad nor the loop have got large capacity. And yet we knew that we are able to combine information from them. This is particularly acute in attempting to explain how we understand language. If I give you a sequence of unrelated words to repeat back, you can probably manage five or six. If it makes a sentence, however, it's probably 15 or 16 or maybe 20. So where is it held together and how? A second problem was created by an important discovery made by Meredith Danneman and Pat Carpenter at Carnegie Mellon University in the US. They were interested in the role of working memory in language and in individual differences in people's ability to comprehend 
complex prose. They developed a measure which attempted to combine storage with attentional manipulation. On the face of it, it's a very simple task. The task is known as working memory span and in its original form requires participants to read a series of sentences and to remember the last word of each. So in this case, the participant would read, the black dog bit the old man. It was a terribly cold winter when he arrived at the farm. Climate change is one of the world's worst problems and then would have to recall man, farm, problems. This simple task proves to be quite complex. People typically have a span of around three and is a very effective predictor, not only of comprehension capacity, but of a wide range of other activities from learning a new computer programming language through capacity to focus attention to reasoning and performance on standard intelligence tests. And in the last 20 years, there's been intensive activity in this area, both exploring the breadth of this effect and attempting to identify what the essence of the effect is. Because the feeling is, if we know what makes this difficult, then we'll know what lies at the center of measures of intelligence. There are certainly theories about this. Um, at the moment, I think, no one theory is dominant, um, but it's still a very active area. However, with our simple three-component model, we had no way of explaining how this task was done. And so, after 25 years of three components, we finally added a fourth. Our proposed solution to the problem of how the various components of working memory interact is shown here. We proposed, after 25 years, a fourth component, the episodic buffer. It's a buffer in the sense that it's a temporary system for storing information that allows different parts of the working memory system to talk to each other and to talk to perception and long-term memory. It achieves this by having the capacity to encode at multiple levels, not just the phonological, the visual, the spatial, but also to link to perception and long-term memory. In doing so, it represents the output in terms of episodes or chunks that are pulled together into a system of limited capacity. Uh, as in Nelson Cowan's model, which I'll mention briefly later, we assume it has a capacity of about three or four episodes or chunks. We also assume that it is accessible to conscious awareness, indeed that it is the seat of awareness, and that information flows in from the subsystems into the episodic buffer and is then made aware through the central executive. However, while this solves some of our problems, it leaves us open to the argument that, well, it's easy to present this system, but how do you test it? How do you use it productively? And we decided that we would tackle a central issue, namely the question of how information is bound together within the episodic buffer into the chunks or episodes. Our original model assumed intentionally that everything had to go through the central executive and that the executive was important in manipulating and creating chunks. We thought we could test this by using our concurrent task methods and over the next few years did so, systematically blocking the central executive, the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad and looking at the binding together of colour and shapes into coloured objects 
binding together of words into sentences and asking to what extent, if we block the central executive, is binding prevented. We found that blocking the executive consistently impaired performance, as you'd expect, but it didn't disrupt the binding, which suggests that this goes on off stage and that the episodic buffer is a passive system for holding information that's bound elsewhere. We now see the episodic buffer as being the recipient of information from the two subsystems, which in turn pull together information from perception. In the case of the sketch pad, information from space, from touch, from kinesthesis. In the case of the phonological loop, we know it as access not only from speech, but also from sign language and lip reading. We also think that the rehearsal system for the phonological loop is atypical of rehearsal in general, and that rehearsal in general involves a process that's sometimes called refreshing, focusing attention on a representation in the episodic buffer and maintaining it in that way. You'll see a couple of dotted lines, one for smell and taste. These are totally speculative but we suspect that you can, to some extent, maintain a smell or a taste briefly by concentrating on it. But that's still to be explored, so far as we're concerned. So how does our model fit with other models within the field? The model with which we are most frequently compared is that proposed by Nelson Cowan. As you can see, this appears to be totally different from our own. Nelson regards working memory as the activated portion of long-term memory. And he feels that its limited capacity is based on the focus of attention. Like us, he assumes a central executive and brief sensory storage. In addition to the focus of attention, he assumes that areas of long-term memory are activated and hence readily contribute to the focus of attention. This is often seen as totally different from our own. The differences, however, are far more apparent than real. When we discuss issues, we find we largely agree. But the major difference is one of focus. Nelson's background is in attention and in developmental psychology. Much of his work in recent years has focused on the capacity of working memory and establishing that it appears to be about four chunks or episodes. In talking about other aspects being activated long-term memory, he does not propose that this is an adequate explanation. He is, in effect, treating long-term memory as a broad category, saying these are areas that I'm not focusing on at the moment, and has, in fact, done classic and important work on the phonological loop. Returning to our own model, I would view Nelson Cowan's work as focusing on the interface between the central executive and the episodic buffer a crucial interface and clearly of enormous importance. Much of the activity of the two subsystems operates outside this and certainly does involve long-term memory. For example, even something like digit span depends on familiarity with the digit. If I tested your digit span in your native language, for example English, you'd probably manage six or seven or eight numbers. If I tested it in Finnish, it would be much less, because, of course, you already have those numbers in long-term memory. In the case of sentences, our span is greatly expanded by our knowledge of grammar, of meaning, and of context, all of which depend on long-term memory. So, how does long-term memory fit into multi-component model.
This is a very simple way of trying to capture my view of the relationship between long-term memory and working memory. I view it as providing an interface between long-term memory and perception and lots of other things that go on in the brain and action. It's not essential for perception to link to action. For example, if an object suddenly came flying towards you, you'd put your hand up automatically. However, if you are performing some complex operation, then it's likely to go through working memory. So far from denying a role for long-term memory in working memory, the model depends crucially on this interface. Inevitably, in something as complex as working memory has become, there are likely to be misunderstandings, and I'd just like to mention a few of them here. So, multi-component working memory is not just everything that happens in the first few seconds. What happens in the first few seconds is a mix of perception, long-term memory, attention, and lots of other things. So simply using a time-based system will not allow you to filter out what is working memory and what is not. It's not just the phonological loop, although my own work has focused heavily on that, largely for historical reasons and because I thought it was simple enough to make progress. Working memory is not independent of long-term memory, as I've explained, nor is it independent of perception. Again, the phonological loop has probably evolved from more basic capacities for speech perception and production, and an adequate understanding of the loop will require an understanding of these interfaces. And finally, as explained earlier, my views are not inconsistent with Nelson Kahn's, and I'm happy to say we both agree on this. So rather than conclude on what working memory is not, what is it? Well, first of all, it's a conceptual framework rather than a specific model. I tend to think of theories as like maps, and the multi-component working memory theory as being a sketch map covering a very wide area. Most of it in relatively little detail. I assume that in due course, if it continues to survive, that the detail will gradually be filled in, that links to long-term memory, to perception, to action will develop. But I hope the simple four-component model will continue to be a useful overview of what is a very complex and fascinating area.